This is What's New, taking a look at you and your world. The unusual, the entertaining, and the stimulating. With Warren Martin, Nancy Nelson, and Gil Amundsen to let you know what's new. Good morning. It's nice to have you here on What's New. This is my partner, Nancy Nelson. My name is Warren Martin. We have some very, very good things ahead for you today. We have a, a third guest on our set already, as a matter of fact. This little bird is a very young sparrow hawk, and it's one of the things... Ooh! It's one of the things we're going to talk about with Barb Walker from the Raptor Rehabilitation Program today. We already have some beautiful owls out and hawks, and, uh, and we've got some lovely things to show you. It's going to be a good show for the children, I think. And rarely on What's New Now do we really interview authors, uh, but there is an exception. There is a gentleman and his wife who are now in the Twin Cities, and we're so anxious for you once again to meet Mr. Irving Stone and Mrs. Stone. He has written a number of books which have been gigantic, worldwide bestsellers. His latest is um, biographical uh, about Charles Darwin. The book is appropriately titled The Origin, and he has gone into incredible research to show you the conclusions and how he arrived at them of the, uh, the theory of evolution. A remarkable author. It should be a good show. Sit down and enjoy it for the next half hour, if you will. Right now, we'll start off with news and our friend Gil Amundsen. Good morning, Gil. Good morning. Just about a perfect day underway in the Twin Cities. Clear to partly cloudy. We should have a high today, about 85. Now we have sunny skies, southwest winds at 7 miles per hour. The temperature is 72 degrees. That's news. More at 5.30 this afternoon on News Center 11. Now, the rest of what's new, here's Nancy and Warren. Thank you, Gil. In just a few minutes, I think you'll be paying rapt attention to Birds of Prey. <laughs> that is Bubo. We'll be meeting in just a moment. This is Barb Walker. She's here today representing the Raptor Rehabilitation Program at the University of Minnesota, a remarkable organization that we'll tell you about. And you have just missed the best part of the show. <laughs> These birds have been sitting here quietly for, what, 10, 15 mm -hmm. minutes? Of and course. during the commercial, they all went, woo! One flew up in the set, the other one was on the floor, one's trying to get away. The owl you're holding, Barb, just proves that raptors are very unpredictable. That's right. Uh, this is a bird that I've had for seven years, and normally they don't handle like this, but he's the, I'm the only one that he'll trust. Strix, turn Strix around. Is a barred owl, and he's only got one wing, so he's permanently crippled and consequently um, will remain in captivity the rest of his life. But the University of Minnesota's program for birds of prey is a program designed to get birds back to the wild again. And, oh, I think it's about 45 percent now go back to the wild of the number of birds that are turned into the university doctors. A barred owl is not an uncommon mm. owl in our area. Where would we see one? Well, there would, there, owls are, are birds that live in the woods and they're nocturnal, so you don't normally see them during the day. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, you can hear them at night, and if even in this in the uh, metropolitan area, if you're out and about on a hike around your neighborhood during the night, if you've got any wooded areas or parks, you may be able to spot one by its hooting. As you point out, don't be misled by the fact that Barb is handling Strix so easily. It yeah, is this rare. Is very unusual yes. that they handle like now, Strix. This. Will you sit up there and be good? Hopefully, maybe not. I, I'm wearing a glove too. Oh, we'll I help him. You go He'll ahead and help just him. Go hide. Will he? Yeah. All right. Now, here, Barb, I'll give you a hand, Mike. I'll pick up one, and I'm going to get on the other side. If we seem disorganized, it's right. only because the animals aren't doing what we're no, doing. No, not at all. But they're not used to beauty. being together, and they're not used to uh, uh, being so close together on, perch on these perches. So Tell them about it's a this little. beautiful bird. This is a red-tailed hawk, and it, all four of the birds we've, we have here today are very common in Minnesota um, owls, and, owls and hawks, but the red-tailed hawk is the most common soaring hawk. This particular <laughs> bird was taken in, out, of, out of a nest and 
something very sad was done to her wings. Her wings were pinioned, which is cutting the en end bones of the wings off. Sometimes game farms use this method to keep birds, game, and waterfowl from migrating. But with uh, a red-tailed hawk or any other type of bird of prey, it's, it's, it's extremely illegal and very unkind because she never can go free again. Those also, Barb, look at her. Now, th that means that she is a permanent resident at right. the Raptor Rehabilitation Program. Take a look at her talons. Uh, on Birds of Prey, we call the feet talons. Right. And she has some permanent injury here. We can see that she's missing two toenails. Right. The nails or the talons on, on the middle toes on each foot are missing. Uh, the doctors don't really know what happened to her feet, whether it happened before she was taken out of a nest or, or whether it, would, it happened uh, in captivity. But uh, that's another reason for her, for her reason, or for her being in captivity. It would be harder for her to catch and kill prey with those two talons missing. Is Strix all right back there? He's jumping around on the back of the set. Do you yeah, want to get Strix? Be, no, he'll He's be okay. okay. All right. We're going to go yeah, over here. This but is Bobo. another bird that lives with me. They, you have never seen antagonism till a, a, an owl no. like this looks at you this way. This Bubo is a great horned owl. Right. And, and another he common hates me owl. right now. Look at this. Bubo's been in captivity for seven years also. I, uh, he was turned in the same year that the barred owl was. And his wing was broken up here at this joint. And he was only about six weeks old. Consequently, it, it had healed wrong and couldn't be rebroken and, and, uh, and set properly. So again, he's in captivity for, for good. The, um, the birds here are all used for educational purposes. And it's uh, to, to enhance people's appreciation for these types of birds. So they do have a purpose, even though they can't go back to the wild again. It's, um, Don't go, Boo. He's Boo. scared of the mic microphone. Oh, is he? Yeah. I frightened him. Don't be mad at me, Boo. As now, you can see, they, they are very unpredictable and not easy to handle at all either. And I'm told, Barb, that they're not owls. People love them because of the way they look. They are not particularly bright, but they no. have such extraordinary senses that they don't have to be smart. They can hear and see oh, for... seven to ten times better than, than our eyesight and hearing. It's just amazing what an owl can hear, even without using his eyesight at night. And look at, now we had talked about, <laughs> I'm sorry, Boo-Boo, don't be mad at me. We had talked about talons before. Look at the talons on this great horned owl. Yes. It, it's, it, They're capable of doing a lot of damage. The great horned owl is one of the most uh, fierce birds of prey. They'll attempt to catch just about anything for their for their prey. And consequently, they do get into more trouble than, than some other birds of prey do. In fact, the feet are far more more dangerous on a bird of prey than the beak. Is that not true? That's right. Now, Unless you've got uh, a bird that's been in captivity for most of its life and uses its beak for defense. But normally their beaks are just for tearing and, and uh, uh, eating. I'm trying to keep this one away from Bubo, and right. I wanted her to go on the perch, but she's not interested, so I got the whole ball of wax. Okay. This okay. is a beautiful little kestrel, or we know them as a sparrow hawk. Mm -hmm. What can you take? Now, this is a young one, Barb. Right. I got it. She's only several months old. This one is scheduled to go free. She was um, taken into captivity by a young uh, boy. In fact, she was brought across st uh, state lines, which makes it a federal offense besides a state offense. Yeah, you can't but just pick up birds of prey because no, you're all, allowed to. They're all protected by the federal and state governments. But she was turned into the university, and now she needs to be taught how to take, how to take care of herself in the mm -hmm. wild in order to go free but she is scheduled for release by the end of the summer. That brings up a question. People often want to help care for a bird, and, and the best thing to do, especially with a bird of prey, the Raptor Rehabilitation Program at the University of Minnesota can help you, and people find they're very interested and want somehow to take part. In fact, they offer memberships to That's assist right. in, in just the financial end of this, Barb. The, um, the clinic is located on the veterinary campus of the University of Minnesota, but it is not supported. It isn't uh, actually part of the university funding. All the funding for the university, uh, for the Raptor Rehabilitation Program comes through private individuals, foundations, and grants. And it's very important that people do contribute to the program in order to keep it going and, and 
continue to get these birds back out into the wild the again. The phone number there is 373-0821. Right. If you're interested, if you have any questions, or if you ever find a bird, get it to them, and possibly it will not end up permanently crippled. Barb Walker from the Raptor Rehabilitation Program. Bubo, you are great. Strix, you Don't weren't too terrific. <laughs> Strix is somewhere under the set. We'll be back with the marvelous Irving Stone. I told you earlier that uh, it's a rather rare occasion when we have to uh, interview people who are authors, but uh, this delightful couple we welcome back. We've had the pleasure of visiting with them in the past. Uh, they are Irving and Jean Stone, and the latest effort that they have compiled here is called The Origin, uh, the biography of Charles Darwin, and it is a pleasure to welcome you back. A biographical novel about oh. Charles Darwin. Thank you for correcting Quite me, Irving. Quite a difference. In a biography, there are three persons involved. There's the author, the hero, and the reader and their paths very rarely come together. In a biographical novel, there's only one person because I identify totally with Charles Darwin, for example, in this book. I become Darwin, and then the reader becomes Darwin. So the Darwin, myself, and the reader make one person, and that's the way to read a book. This, of course, is part of the key, I suspect, to the success of your efforts, and, and you've had some incredibly successful efforts. It's, I, I think it sometimes bothers me at first when I start reading your books about the quotations and the dialogue because I begin to accept it as though you were there or as though I were there listening to it. And then, then pretty soon it doesn't bother me at all. I accept the fact, well, somehow or other, you know that Charles Darwin said, uh, 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 well, I'm, I'm now going to be off for, uh, for Cape Good Hope or wherever he's headed. Well, you see, we have great resources. We have thousands of letters by Darwin and to him and all through the family. We have his diaries, his journals. We have his books. We have things that people have written about him, records of dialogue and conversations during his lifetime that the family put down so that when I have Darwin speak, I'm speaking, but it is truly what Darwin would have said and in the manner in which he would have said it. I understand, Jane, that both of you have visited a lot of the places that Darwin did uh, sail to and, and did his research. We've been to all of them, including that beautiful, beautiful set of islands of the Galapagos. The only one we lacked was the uh, Terra del Fuego, which is way, way down on the tip of um, South, America. South America. And we didn't go to that particular island because it's almost inaccessible and because Darwin himself wrote so magnificently about it and because what really happened was that uh, Fitzroy the captain was returning some uh, natives who had been picked up on an earlier voyage and that's what editing is also you try not to include items that and uh, little stories that are garden paths that are slightly irrelevant even though they're nice. Uh, you make no bones about the fact that, uh, that Darwin's early career academically w was just ho-hum at best. Oh, at best. He was a mediocre student because he didn't care about studies. In four years at Cambridge, he came in, I think, 11th in his class, which is not all that good. Uh, nobody thought he was going to do anything except John Henslow, his friend and tutor, at Christ College. As a matter of fact, he came out of college and went home and his father said, well, now you have to become a clergyman. And, and he said, all right, that's my agreement with you when I refuse to be a doctor. Then came that letter from heaven, the miracle, inviting to him to go on to HMS Beagle as an unfinished naturalist. I love that phrase because he was not a naturalist. Now, the first three weeks he's out, he's seasick. The next fourth week he lands on, in South America. He starts excavating the cliffs. He finds layers of sand and layers of pebble up four or five thousand feet, which means either the mountains have risen or the sea has fallen. He gave him his first concept of the movement of the seas and the mountain ranges. <clears throat> now, fourth day he was sitting under a tree having his lunch of biscuit and uh, water. cold water, and he said, you know, to himself, he's all alone, there's never been a book on the geology of South America. He said, I can write that book. And at that instant, the carefree boy who liked only to shoot pheasants and gather beetles became a man. And what a man. They say he was the greatest scientific brain the world has ever had. Many of us may have some misconceptions about what Darwin really believed or, or what his entire hypothesis was. But at, at any rate, we all have kind of a, of a fuzzy idea of what he was trying to substantiate. 
Within that framework, I'm curious how you both felt about this as it evolved for you. Uh, did you become the true believer? Well, uh, let's were you a skeptic? Let's, let's start with Darwin. When he got on the Beagle, he belonged to the Church of England, even though his mother was a uh, Unitarian. His father described Unitarians as the net to, fall, to catch fallen Christians. Darwin believed in all 37 articles of the Church of England, had no reason to doubt any of them. As he spent his years on the Beagle finding mastodons in cliffs that were millions of years old and finding the skeletons of fish up 7,000 feet and finding plants that uh, had not been on Earth or for you know centuries and whatnot, he realized that there was a sense of continuing life, so he devolved this entire theory of evolution. Now, what you are asking me is, did he believe in God and do I believe in God? Okay. Let's do it by spelling. God is spelled G-O-D. There's another beautiful word called L-A-W, law. Darwin interpreted God's laws, the laws that run this universe from the beginning until now. This universe was not created in the six days of Genesis. We have proof on it. The new president of the Southern Baptist said, other people don't have to believe it was six days that the universe was created because there were no clocks and no calendars, so there were no 24-hour days, so it could have been six periods of a year, a thousand years, a hundred thousand years. Mm. It has been only four days since the book The Origin has actually been uh, for sale. I'm now informed it's already in the 11th place on the bestsellers list. You're going to hear so much more about it. And also, if you would like to have a chance to meet the Stones and have them autograph the book for you or some of their earlier books, they will be at Powers Department Store in downtown Minneapolis at noon today. They'll be at Southdale B. Dalton's bookstore this afternoon at 2.30. And I can assure you that uh, they're delightful people. They'd love to have a chance to visit with you. Uh, also, in advance, I wish you happy anniversary. I thank you. How many years will it be? 46. 46. Not too bad. <laughs> delightful to have you with us. Gene and Irving Stone. Good Thank to be you. with you again. We continue with more of What's New in just a minute. We'll see you tomorrow on What's New. We're going to do some aerobic dancing and talk to a cat doctor. All of his patients, he says, are under the bed. Please join us tomorrow at 11. Thank you. This is What's New, taking a look at you and your world. The unusual, the entertaining, and the stimulating. With Warren Martin, Nancy Nelson, and Gil Amundsen to let you know what's new. Good morning. It's nice to see you today. It's raining a little outside. It's kind of gray. They should stick with us. Absolutely, although my monkeys do not dance in the rain. Other than that, Nancy will, in fact, be engaged today in some aerobic dancing. This is one of the great crazes that's sweeping the country. Presumably, you get into great shape and you have fun doing it. It's less, less tedious. Well, they've been practicing down at the end of the studio, and it looks like very hard work. But, but we'd encourage you to get, a, get up at home and do it along with us. And then later in the show, I have enjoyed reading this book. It's called All My Patients Are Under the Bed, The Memoirs of a Cat Doctor. This cat doctor, Dr. Kamuti, is 87 years old, still makes daily house cat calls in New York City. And his New York license plate says simply cat. We'll tell you more. There's kind of an interesting story about that, too. We'll tell you more about that later. Right now, it's time for Gil Amundsen to tell you what's new. Gil, it seems like this is kind of a gray and wet day. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Good morning. Yes, this is a gray and wet day around the Twin Cities. Elsewhere, showers have a high today, about 75 and more on the weather a bit later. In the Twin Cities, right now, we have cloudy skies, the winds from the south at 7 miles per hour. Humidity high at 78% and the temperature 67 degrees. That's news. We have more at 5.30 this afternoon on News Center 11. Now back to Warren. Thank you, Gail. Nancy's at this very moment changing into aerobic dancing tags, and we'll give you a demonstration of that right after this message.
Boy, that music is infectious. I just feel like dancing when I hear it. Do you know that, Nancy? You're faking. You don't feel like it at all. But Gretchen <laughs> Kellogg is going to help us with that. Aerobic dancing is something that was originated by Jackie Sorensen. And, in fact, it is exercise to and things for your respiration. Well, what it does, really, is it combines all the benefits of jogging with simple-to-learn dances that are its just so much fun. You're actually getting very conditioned. It affects the cardiovascular system, the lungs and the heart. It affects all the trimming, firms up the muscles, and also keeps you very flexible. Keeps you from aging, and it's ja a lot of fun. Jackie Sorensen was, was sort of the originator of this, if not the originator, certainly one of the prime movers in this effort, right? Right. Uh, what happened is she got so turned on to Ken Cooper's books on aerobics. Mm -hmm. And she started this in 1969. So she lived in an Air Force base in Puerto Rico. And with her husband, and they approached her on getting some kind of a physical fitness class going for the women on the base. And at the same time, she was reading Cooper's books on aerobics. So she decided to go out and take his 12-minute walk-run test. Mm -hmm. And she scored excellent. And she figured that it had to be from all her dancing experience. And she is a choreographer. She has a degree in muscular physiology. She's been on the President's Physical Fitness Council. So she has a lot of background behind her. She started this program, and we now have 80,000 instructors. Mm -hmm. Nationwide. Nationwide. We, su we suggested that our viewers should be prepared to join in this morning. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason at all why they could not at this point? Should, would, would there be any possible restriction for them to not do so? No, there really is no restriction. The only thing we ask is usually if we have women and men from ages 20 to 70, and uh, the only restriction would be that we usually ask for a good physical um, after the age of 30. If that you're starting at home with us this morning, just be careful. Temper yourself a little bit. And I am certainly a beginner. Cheryl came along. Barb came along. Yes. They are beginners. And this is for men, too, but Warren says he's just <laughs> going to stand there. <laughs> so what are you going to do first? How do we start? Well, it? what we'd like to do first, see, the class goes like this. We have a warm-up first, mm -hmm. and which is very essential to dancing, as Nancy probably knows. And we have um, a flexibility stretching time and we do sit-ups then we begin our aerobic session and we go through okay can we begin right dances. now and, and okay. warm up a little bit what we want to do is warm up first. Okay. so i'm going to teach nancy and you're going to scoot huh now, no i'm going to hold the mic for you That's oh okay okay right. now you're going to teach us first the steps and then we'll put then music we'll put some it. music okay we don't need okay. the music yet all right we okay. don't need music yet not yet no okay no. We all can right. backtrack a little. We're going to do just some little knee bends, and all of this is just to get you really stretched Warren, out. Warren, you could have done Do you know this. why we snap, mm -hmm. Nancy? No, I don't. For fun. <laughs> <laughs> Exercising okay. your fingers. Right, and flexibility. All right, then we're going to okay. do just a little side bend to the side. Keep your chest to the front and a little snap, okay? Good, four of those. Then we're going to do the breaststroke to the right for upper body work. Stretch out. Good. Okay. You just swing on your legs. That's right. And working away from the arm movement. Oh, Two right. claps, and then we're going to stretch left. Why do we clap? Uh, Let's go for, fun. for a break. All right. And it gets your heart going. Okay. okay. All, right. All right. Because you're going to do a little bounce, too, and that's what gets the old heart working. All right. All right. Then we're going to stretch left. Then after that, we're going to do a little walk forward. Okay. You step high. Yes. And when we jog to the right, get those knees up. We don't want you to be lazy. Turn in a circle to the right. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. okay. And then we're going to lunge forward and back. Left foot. Oh, forward. Okay. And back together. And again. Okay. Isn't this fun? <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Then after that, we're going to clap too slow and four step to the right. Right together, right together, Four, right three, together. Clap, Four. and this way. One, two, two okay. three. Okay. All right, and we do that again. The only thing new we'll do is a little um, knee lift with a snap, okay? So I think we can okay. get the music going. Let's go back okay, here. Okay, well, I'll get out of your way and let you ladies okay. go over here. First thing we're going to do is a knee bend. Okay. We won't do this all the way through because we'll get to some other steps. Right, okay. knee bends. Here we and go. This is just a warm up. Push to the Simple to be making any because you're warming up your muscles to oh, right. make sure you do not injure yourself. All right. Stretch, right stroke. Oh, breast stroke. Clap two. Stroke left. We'll do this three times? Yep. Okay. Oh. But don't fall over when you do it. Clap two. Walk forward. How many times? Chalk eight to the right. 
and doing this part because I want to get to thoroughly modern Millie. So oh, you want it, Charles. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, what we're going to do with that is this is the first aerobic dance. So we're all warmed up. Our muscles are ready to go. Okay. And what we're going to do is our first dance, which isn't as high level as dance number six, of course. Of course. All right. So what we're going to do with that is we're going to walk hips, six of these, clap two, and Charleston. Okay. Charleston, okay. got that? Yeah. Two of those series. Walk around. One. Jog six together, seven. Seven means we're going to clap. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. When we're doing that, we're going to show you a phone number on the bottom of the screen. If you're interested in aerobic classes, aerobic dancing by Jackie Sorensen, you can call 292-8585 for more information. We're just going to keep showing you all the way into the commercial. Oh, Let's go. Okay, music. Music, please. <laughs> And walk it. Oh. Clap to Charleston. Everything today is there. Oh, you really get you All you have Check to do is around. Around. Everything you Dog six, 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 seven. Seven. Oh. <laughs> Charleston. It's not insanity. <laughs> says vanity fair. Walk around. In fact, walk six, six, it's time six, to six, raise six, your skirts. We are already anxious to talk with Dr. Louis J. Camuti. The name of his book is All My Patients Are Under the Bed. Dr. Camuti came to America from Italy with his parents when he was only nine years old. Today he is 87 years old and still works every day making house calls. And doctor, you found a long time ago that it was efficient to go to the home that the cat lived in and it was important to start late in the day. Well, uh, uh, actually uh, the uh there's no question that a, a cat became uh, disturbed when he was brought into a new habitat. See, a cat loves its home first and the people second. And that's how they went around for thousands of years as loners, uh, so that being left free was the important thing for them to uh, survive. So when they're brought away into a strange place, strange smells, strange uh, people, noises, and so forth, they're greatly disturbed. So I felt it's not very practical from a point of view of practice because it's difficult to park and uh, it's just almost impossible. But uh, since I started so many years ago, I decided I would continue. And that's where they should be seen. Now, I can't see 100% of the cases at home, but I can do 80 of them. There are, there are x-rays and, and surgical, uh, surgical operations, which have to have a hospital with a lot of equipment. But in about 80% of the cases, I can handle at home. And uh, it's a lot easier on the cat, but if, if a person said, it's so much easier for us to c have you come to me, take, I won't take them. Hmm. Because it's for the person, I won't do it, but it's for the cat, I'll do it very gladly. <laughs> Doctor, you suggest in your book, All My Patients Are Under the Bed, that you have at one point or another treated every, virtually every creature that'll fit in inside the door, through the door of a New York apartment. But obviously you have a special love for cats. I suggested that maybe you could retell us the story of your license plate, which pretty much identifies how you feel. Well, yes, my license plate is cat. I tried for years to get it. I had um, VD for a while. As in veterinary doctor. Uh, and veterinary <laughs> doctor. And the kids used to say, don't touch it, you'll get it. And, uh, so finally, I did, and the, the police would give you a summons while they were laughing. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, heck, with this, I'll change that. And I got uh, through some mutual friends. They gave me a big party in New York uh, when they gave me the license plates. And they finally, it, it was prohibited for a while, but then they finally threw a line and, and let us in there. And, and we got the, about three or four years ago, and got the license plate cat. I've so now it. the children pass by and say, meow. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to get a horn that when they say meow, I'll blow the horn and return the meow. 
Doctor, We're working on it. I'm sorry. As I had suggested, you begin your house calls. Your day starts very late because you suggest there's no point in visiting the house with, uh, without the owners at home. So you don't really well, start work till 4 in the afternoon and you work till right. midnight. I, well, till 1 o'clock most of the time. That's right. Years ago, I used to go from 9 to 12. I used to work 15 hours a day. But now, uh, all the women are working uh, if, they're, if they're single, if they're good many of the married people, and there's no more uh, live-in maids or help. So the net result is that there's nobody home much before 4 o'clock. So I have to go there, and, and as I often say, I carry 18 keys with me to different apartments. I go in there and shoot the cat and go. But the trouble is, find, the, find a cat that's in a 14-room apartment that's getting away from you. You're there the rest of the day, so I, I gave that up. I'm not taking any more keys. You claim to be the fastest shot in the East. So they say. My own doctor asked me to give him shots once in a while. Well, with the cat, it's either the fast and the dead. You know, you can't, you can't dilly-dally with the cat. He'll turn around and get you. Doctor, it's pretty hard to find any kind of a physician these days who is going to make a house call. And so I would assume that you have a lot of patients and their owners who would like to have you. Do you have any criteria as to how you select a patient that you will continue to see? Uh, no. Mine, mine are, uh, first of all, I had my name taken out when I closed my office 17 years ago on Park Avenue. I had my name taken out of the yellow pages so that they can't, they can't uh, just look me up and then, you know, maybe it's a dog or a, or a cow, who knows, you know. So I had that, and mine is all referred, word of mouth. One patient refers the other. See, I have a criteria, three criteria uh, to fit as a, as a client. One, they must be uh, sincere in their love for the cat. Secondly, they must do as they're told. And third, they've got to pay their bills. If they do those three <laughs> things, they're my clients, whether they're in a basement apartment of one room or a penthouse of three floors. You tell people when you come that there are certain things they should do for your preparation, and one of them that's has to do with booze, and people always think you want to drink when you get right. there. That's right. See, the greatest antiseptic is vodka. First of all, the American vodka is made of grain alcohol, so you've got pure ga grain alcohol with water. So that's much better than the, than the rubbing alcohol, that if you drink it, you know, you get sick. So they have to have vodka. vodka. If they have uh, vodka, then uh, some other whiskey will substitute. But I start with that. And uh, they must have a certain type of soap. We can name it. Ivory soap, right? Ivory Why do you soap. like ivory? What's the good well, about because that? because it, 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 uh, I'm allergic to a lot of things, cats. He's dogs. allergic to cats. Yeah, I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I can take them 12 hours a day, but I can't have any to get home. See, with antihistamines, then I can take them. So, and I'm allergic to a lot of the uh, perfumes. So uh, uh, ivory soap is the idea. So they have ivory soap, cotton. Now I go in some houses, for example, they have vodka, and then I say uh, they don't have cotton. You've got Kleenex, I haven't got, Kleenex. got toilet tissue. I've got houses where they have vodka and no toilet tissue. <laughs> <laughs> and all my patients are under the bed. Dr. Kamuti tells you about 60 years of working as a veterinarian, obviously loving every bit of it. And I guess all of us who have pets that we love would like to think we'd encounter someone like you who would love them back for us. Thank you. It's, it's a marvelous, entertaining it's a, uh, book filled with tons of humor and, and anecdotes. If you want a cat, it's, it's almost uh, demand reading. If you don't own one, it'll tell you more about the peculiarities of the animals and their owners. How very nice to meet Thank you, sir. You. Come Great. back and Pleasure. see us on your 90th birthday. Thank you. Dr. Lewis, <laughs> I'll leave the nice you in New York. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Tomorrow is our day for our great children's fashion show. Hundreds of you uh, applied and sent us nice letters, and I'll tell you, that's one of the dumbest ideas I've ever had because it was really tough to make a decision. But tomorrow we will present our half dozen models right here wearing their new togs, which, of course, they'll walk away with as well. I think you'll enjoy visiting with them. And then this month in Life magazine, they commemorate the 35th anniversary of that famous picture taken on VJ Day by Alfred Eisenstadt. We'll talk with him tomorrow on What's New. Thanks for joining us.